On my show tonight, three very talented performers, three people who've delighted and entertained audiences both here and abroad. One heads up a band which, next to the Bee Gees and uh, Olivia Newton-John, is Australia's most successful and lucrative musical export. The group is the Little River Band, the leader, Glenn Shorrock, and we'll be hearing from the band and talking to Glenn Shorrock a little later on. Also on the show, an actress who made a name for herself on stage, screen and television, and she is Miss Carol Ray. But first, an institution, no more, no less, both here and in England. His contribution to Anglo-Australian relationships started in 1966 when he created a comic strip called Barry Mackenzie. The strip craftily exploited the prejudices of Australians versus the Poms. The Australians, as personified by Barry Mackenzie, were beery, chundersome and incomparably vulgar. The Poms were rapacious, mean, cunning and, generally speaking, unwashed. It created a new slang, both here and in Britain. He followed that by creating one of the most majestic and hilarious comic creations of modern comedy, Dame Edna Everidge. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Humphreys. <laughs> What have you got there? I'm afraid I shouldn't have carried this on. This is the... Uh, I was, in fact, giving myself a quick brush down before coming on this <laughs> programme. Is it one of those suits that collects lots of fluff? Yes, unfortunately, I didn't see which way the, the arrow was pointing. Would you like to... And I've deposited a great amount of lint <laughs> on a part of my anatomy, which, fortunately, you won't be looking at tonight. The rest of it's quite spruce, actually. Yes, I heard you were wearing blue, so I thought I'd team myself. I, know. I always wear blue, actually. I've only got blue suits. Listen, I mentioned the, the, this creation of yours, Dear Men and In fact, the last time I interviewed you was the occasion of my 200th show in Britain. And uh, you were on with Gloria Swanson, who seemed perplexed, to say the least, by this monstrous creation next to her. Do you, I mean, she said to me after the show, she actually said, you know, that's the most extraordinary woman that I've ever been on television with. And I said, <laughs> I said, but Gloria, it's not a woman, it's a man. And she said, I thought it had got big feet, she said. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, do you, does Edna cause that confusion in people? Well, I hope so, because Edna is a very real person. In fact, when you said that I'd been on the show, I had to think twice about that, because it, I quite honestly don't feel I've done a Parkinson show before. Really? Uh, this is my first Parkinson show, and it just happens that I am an, uh, an agent, an impresario, and I have a very talented... Uh, artiste called Dame Edna Everett, titled indeed, mm. and she was on your show, and so I heard all about it from her. What did she say? <laughs> well, she really regretted that her best line was lost. You see, she was very anxious to say <laughs> to Gloria Swanson, I never had a silent period. <laughs> but, <laughs> unfortunately, Although I'd written the line inside her glove, <laughs> she never said it. Well, let's just... And so I said it then. <laughs> a very bad impersonation of Dame Edna, viewers. I'm sorry about that. Mm. Does she, in fact, take over, though? I mean, was that a real statement you made, that this is the first time that you've done this show? Yeah, well, it is, in a sense. I, it, she, it, she does take over. I, I still hold the majority of shares. But... Uh, from time to time, the personality of Dame Edna is very strong. She is part of my repertoire. She happens to be the most successful character that I promote. Uh, she wears a size of clothing slightly larger than mine mm -hmm. to allow for padding in various places, athletic supports and that type of thing. <laughs> but uh, her clothes are much more expensive than mine. You see, I actually spend more money on Edna's clothes than I spend on my own. Excellent, though this suit is beautifully maintained in the wings this evening. But, uh... Where do you buy them from? I mean, do you have to go into frock shops and... and... Yes, I do. You? And what kind of reaction do you get? Well... <laughs> I... Of course, in Australia, I get a lot of help from the Taller Women's Society. <laughs> and I have a round-the-clock watch on the opportunity shop nearest to the Whitlam's home. <laughs> <laughs> because... Edna... <laughs> Edna and Margaret Whitlam are, have many things in common, uh, except, I, I suspect, uh, the, uh, the right honourable member. But, uh, but um, 
I used to just get old cast-offs at opportunity shops or Oxfam shops, mm -hmm. thrift shops, but um, more recently, of course, I've had to have things made, and I try to anticipate the fashion. In my last show, I had tennis gear, and, uh, you know, just a few months after that, everyone in Double Bay and Turak was wearing tennis gear. <laughs> I mean, not tennis gear on the tennis court, but when you rush in to have an open sandwich. You should be wearing tennis gear. A trendsetter, indeed. A trendsetter. Edna then became a trendsetter, having been a character in the 50s and early 60s who lagged amusingly behind the latest thing. Mm. People would say, oh, let's go and have a laugh at this funny, uh, funny housewife. Of course, women in the audience identified very much with Edna because there weren't many Australian female comedians. Uh, Edna became sort of really the Australian Lucille Ball well, uh, <laughs> well, she was a comedian. She is, in fact, a comedian rather than a male comic impersonating. So uh, the, the, the tension between a male performer and a female character is absent, so that, that I like to think, takes the drag out of the character of Edna. It's, mm. not really a, it's not, in fact, a drag act, and the pun was not intended, but it's not, in fact, a drag act. That's so right. I suppose you could say that half the Australian population is a very successful drag act. And <laughs> Australian women are the most successful female impersonators in the world. Before you get lynched and they come leaping over the, um, the uh, barricades at you, let's go back and have a look at uh, that show that I talked about with uh, Gloria Swanson. Uh, just for two reasons, because this shows the new, day, this is Dame Edna we see here now, the one you've talked about. And then later on we'll go and have a look at the Edna of the sort of 50s that you've also been talking about. Let's have a look now at this show with uh, the confused uh, Miss Swanson, uh, faced with Dame Edna in full spate. Would all Australians be as, as, as interesting as you to talk to, though, do you think? In Australia, darling? Yes, in Australia. Well, no, frankly not. I, as a matter of fact, I think you're wasting your time. I am a fascinating... <laughs> I am, as a conversationalist, I'd love you to go and see my husband, Norm, when you're out there. Oh, how home. is he? Oh, very far from Will. I've only got one husband, but he's like seven, I can tell you that, Miss Swanson. <laughs> he's got this terrible... He's got a... At the moment, it's quiescent, but he's got what's called a rumbling prostate. <laughs> he's always had this problem with his little... You know, the gland? Well, goodness knows where it is. Poor Gloria's looking at me askance. I'm not permissive, darling. I'm but it's <laughs> rumbling. That means that it's anything can happen. And so, we have been advised by one of the greatest Parley Street prostatologists. <laughs> we have been advised that a transplant is in order. And we're just waiting for a donor, Mike. We... <laughs> you might step off the plane at just the right moment. Who knows? But I shouldn't say this. I mean, this is not a thing I refer to. And I know my husband is a very, very keeps a very low profile with regard to his illness. As a matter of fact, he only, never mentions his prostate. And when he does, he only mentions it in passing. As a matter of fact, <laughs> that's the only time he ever feels it. <laughs> Of course, you, you wrote, of course, one of your many cultural achievements. You wrote the well-known international bestseller called... What's the matter with it? <laughs> Living with a prostate problem, didn't you? <laughs> Which is translated into many languages. I, I think I'm one of the very... Please take no notice of this levity. <laughs> Miss Swanson. Miss Swanson doesn't like the permissive side of this show. Oh. Have you no sensitivity whatever? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have written a book, Miss Swanson called living with a prostate problem and I think I'm one of the few women who have. I think it's that's all I'm prepared to say. <clears throat> all right. That was a lovely moment. She is an enormous size, isn't she? She is, yes. Extraordinary. I mean do I look as big as that sitting here? Much smaller, surely yes. more reticent. M much more reticent and uh, shapelier. Certainly better looking. <laughs> <laughs> She's hideous, really, isn't she? Uh, it's uh, funny with so many ghastly sides to it, and it's a composite of so many dreadful things. She does emerge as a nice person all the same, I mm. think. And how many, yes, and the thing that point you're making earlier, which is why it appeals to me, is that I don't like drag acts at all. I really don't. I mean, I, th they, I find them creepy to look at. <laughs> and the point you made is that there's no drag aspect at all in, in uh, Dame Edna. She's a comic creation and stands as such. Well, I think only, it would be, I think, uh, unattractive only if I forgot to shave, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I remember, fortunately, before this programme,
but uh, you were saying where do the costumes come from now? Well, some are made, of course. Some are very expensive, and uh, uh, some are discarded by tall women. But I did. Uh, shoes, of course, are very expensive to get made, and I remember going to a big department store to get some shoes. And I said I had a sister who had the same size as I did. And for some reason, she was bedridden. And, uh, and the question arose as to why she needed shoes. Perhaps slippers would be more appropriate. Or indeed, bed socks. And I, I finally was trying these shoes on furtively in the ladies' uh, shoe department. And the head girl came up to me and she said, oh, she said, relax, will you? She said, all the boys get their drag in here. <laughs> So <laughs> that was you do for. Where did in fact uh, where did you meet Dame Edna first of all? I met her on a bus. I was touring uh, southern southeast Victoria in a production of Twelfth Night, which I played Prince Orsino in a very unlikely piece of casting. And uh, at the back of the bus, I, I used to improvise this this voice. You see, I talk like that from the back of the bus. Other people in the bus uh, from town to town would recite verse or tell jokes. And I impersonated this funny woman who would talk about the next town we were going to visit and what the Lady Mayoress was going to say and would there be lamingtons. <laughs> and of course there always were. <laughs> and pavlovas. As you know the world, Australia certainly is divided into the pavs and the pavnots. <laughs> but um, I had this, I, I sort of had very good falsetto and I would chat away in the back of the bus like, and Ray Lawler who was the uh, director and author. He was at that time writing The Summer of the Seventeenth Doll on, on the back of menus. Uh, uh, said, why don't you do that character on the stage in our annual review? And I said, well, I could do the voice. Who could play the part? He suggested I do both. And Edna was born. Mm -hmm. I used old clothes of my mother's at that stage. You know, just a, a pointed hat, a strange shapeless dress, a twin set. I, I, I think there's a generation or two who have no idea what a twin set is. <laughs> and that was the early Edna, much more like a pantomime dame. Um, I, I can't remember details of the costume, but well, I, I think the voice might have been higher then. Well, we've got, we've got a clip, in fact, of, of you in 59 as Edna. And um, this must be the Edna that you've just talked about. Let's have a look at it now. This is from a, a show, a television show. That is me standing outside Australia House. Inside, it's just like your own home. <laughs> oh, downstairs they have wonderful amenities and facilities for the tourists, you know. A lovely bookstore, you can get all the Australian publications, everything Frank Clune ever wrote. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, that's me inside, reading one of the uh, women's magazines that they get their airmail. I used to love popping into Australia House to read the airmail women's magazines, to check up on the latest doings of the royal family. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, that's me in Petticoat Lane, looking at some of the lovely fabrics they have there. Next, please. Oh, there. Uh, that is outside the old Bull and Bush, uh, one of the many guest houses they have in England. <laughs> and that is I'm meeting the people. I made a point of meeting the people in England. You know, so many Australians don't. I just saw anyone who interested me. I bowled straight up to them. I said, excuse me. The voice is very, very high, though, isn't it? Very much higher. <clears throat> yes, I think it is. It's, <laughs> that's archive material, yeah, really. Absolutely. I didn't know that film existed. Mm, 1959, that was. That was a routine I used to do with the, with the slides, of course. Uh, I, I think people still have slide evenings. In fact, I know they do. But uh, more often now, they have films and sound ones, too, because I've seen tourists pointing microphones at the changing of the guard. <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking back on, on your career, it, it would seem that the first time that you started um, uh, performing as a, as a, as a comedian um, or inventing situations would be when you went through a period when you were not an actor, when you involved yourself in a lot of street humour involving practical jokes. There are several legendary ones, actually. One which I want to check out with you because I've heard it many, many times is about you on an aeroplane with a sick bag. Well, I'm going to make this very brief. 
And I'm sorry you brought it up, if I may say Why? so. Why? <laughs> Only... Well, um, I must say that when I'm not working, and every actor has periods when he isn't, for example, I'm not working now, except it feels very like it, I, uh, I like to introduce elements of the extraordinary into everyday life. And if I can disgust a large number of people, it gives me almost as much satisfaction as it gives me to amuse them. <laughs> and so I always carry a large tin of Russian salad somewhere about my person. Uh, now, the airline sick bag is something that all air travellers are familiar with. It's tucked in there between the bulletin and what to do if it crashes. <laughs> I might say that on the card telling you what to do if it crashes, there are a lot of people going down chutes into the ocean, smiling. Have you noticed that? <laughs> They're all beaming as they fasten. <laughs> However, um, I always look at these bags. Uh, now they're just ordinary paper bags. They used to have waterproof material inside them. But I don't think so many people are sick as they used to be. And uh, I was sitting there, and suddenly I thought, why not empty this tin of Russian salad? <laughs> Just one of those things that cross your mind, you know. <laughs> Here I am with a tin of Russian salad and an empty sick bag. Why not bring these two elements together in some way? So, um, of course, I also had a plastic spoon. Now, how to introduce the plastic spoon into the scheme of things was the next problem. And it seemed at that point that the air hostess was sick. I don't know quite, was it, that... I was just eating Russian salad out of the wrong, out of the wrong receptacle. Was there a chip of carrot on my lip that somehow... The result was, of course, you know, people overreact. I think that is a term used by amateur psychologists, but the airline overreacted and I was asked not to travel on that airline. Again. <laughs> but, um... Have you ever noticed there's always carrot there, whether you've had carrot or not? It is strange, isn't it? Strange, it? Yeah, it really is. I think this is a bit that could be well cut from the show. Yeah. But for the benefit of the studio audience, and I've always noticed that tomato skins play a large part. <laughs> you see, as you know, I'm a quite a very conservative, quiet sort of a person. In fact, I really am. But I did pass through a very vulgar stage. <laughs> You see, at school, when everyone told ghastly jokes, I never did. I, I was at least 30 before I started telling filthy stories in public, on film. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, in the Barry Mackenzie films, the business of the un human indignity of being sick hadn't been, you know, really exploited. Of course, since then, there's been Animal House, and lots of people have copied Barry Mackenzie. It's, there has been a chain reaction ever since the interlude on TAA, on uh, that airline. <laughs> but I had to make the imitation. Uh, this is dreadful, isn't it? But I had to actually make this ghastly stuff in the movie, and I made it with uh, tins of tomatoes, lemonade, yogurt, <laughs> diced carrot. I think we've said enough about oh, sweet. <laughs> sweet corn was a very major constituent. <laughs> But uh, it just uh, seemed funny at the time. It doesn't seem at all funny now, and I I'm, so. don't blame all those millions for turning off. No, they wouldn't do that at all. What, what about the plans for the future? I mean, are you able to develop Dame Edna, do you think? Or is it actually got a sort of natural lifespan? Might you phase her out and bring something else in? Yes, well, I would phase out the character if the character is destructible. You would think someone like Edna would self-destruct, wouldn't you? Intricate, <laughs> intricate missile that she is. But uh, I would stop doing the character, because here I confess an exclusive on the Parkinson show that it, it is I who does it. <laughs> I would stop doing her if she ceased to amuse me, or if I felt there were not en enlightening and funny things that I could say about my own life and background and about Australia through the character. But since Australia is growing and developing and getting funnier and funnier, <laughs> so I feel that I can still bring Edna to new audiences. You know, I look down into the stalls and I see kiddies being brought along by their doting, arty, crafty, misguided parents, <laughs> gazing up awestruck and disgusted at this bird of paradise, which thinly disguises a vulture. 
And uh, I feel that uh, so long as I'm entertained by the character, then I'll keep on doing the character. But there are new characters coming along, mm -hmm. you see, in the Bible. But Edna will be the, the, the centerpiece, and that, as I think she's one of the great comic creations of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Barry Humphreys, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. My next guest had the very good sense to choose a Yorkshireman for a father, which, even if he hadn't become rich and famous, which he has, would automatically have qualified him for a spot on this show. His name is Glenn Shorrock, and he's lead singer of Australia's most successful group, the Little River Band. Before I talk to Glenn, let's hear the kind of number which has earned the band 19 platinum discs throughout the world, the Little River Band and Lonesome Loser. Good evening. Of course, you two have uh, met before, haven't you, professionally? Because you Briefly. auditioned, do you not, for Barry? I auditioned for a part in this film, yes, yeah, in well, London, when I was living in Battersea, at the top of a uh, three-story house, a little bed sitter, you know, with a, the stove on the landing, and uh, I read uh, the part of Curly for you. You were too talented, that was the trouble. I had, <laughs> <laughs> and I had more hair then, too, I think. <laughs> Your dad, in fact, was a fitter, wasn't he? And yes. Was there any showbiz at all in your family? No, uh, I've tried to trace any back, but uh, my father's the, uh, the amateur entertainer. He always has been, always entertained me and the family. And the, you know, the Christmas do's, he, he'd get up and do Stanley Holloway impersonations. And he's actually singing now for the uh, old age pensioners. He's got a very good voice. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was brought up with uh, opera. But he could never speak Italian. He'd always do it phonetically in the bathroom, you know. That's where it sounded good. Do all that sort of thing. What about, so, the, um, what about the Holloway monologues? I mean, what, which ones particularly? Well, there's a famous seaside place called Blackpool. That's noted for fresh air and fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. And Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom went there with young Albert, their son. <laughs> a grand little lad with young Albert, all dressed in his suit, quite a swell with a stick with an horse's head handle, the finest that Woolworths could sell. <laughs> Goes on like that. That's a lovely one, yes. It's a lovely old story. Yeah, and the accent makes me homesick, actually. Although yeah. it is, it's more Lancashire than Yorkshire. Is it? Yeah. Well, I, I haven't got the subtleties right yet. Yeah. You emigrated, in fact, when you were 11, weren't you? About 11, yeah. It was 1955, 56, around that time. What were your first impressions of, of Australia? Can you remember? Uh, yes, it was a very strong impression. We were originally intended to go to Melbourne, but on the ship here we were transferred to Adelaide. And the overseas terminal in Adelaide is like, uh, it's like bridge over the River Kwai in a way. It's like, it's just a one corrugated iron with a few cranes and it's in the middle of the mangrove swamp. It's not the prettiest part of town. In fact, you can't even, there's no evidence of a town there at all. And we're all loaded into buses and driven through more mangrove swamps and industrial areas. And gradually we got to this barbed wire fence and bridge over the River Kwai again came up, you know. But all, everybody's grinning, oh, it's lovely here, it's lovely, it's 105 degrees. <laughs> of course, all the, all the mothers, my mother especially, crying their eyes out. And she cried for nine months, I think, for every morning and every night. But it was, it was like, just like a prison camp, the, uh, the uh, migrant hostels in those days. Mm. They're a little more improved now, I hope. But uh, they were pretty nasty places to live in after you've come. I mean, I mean, your mother hated it so much, she went back, didn't you? Did yeah, yeah, we, uh, we took, uh, my sister and I and mother went back and dad was going to follow when he made his fortune. Mm -hmm. But we realised our mistake after nine months back in England and came back out again, got stuck into it, and uh, you know. You mean even England was worse than the concentration it was. camp in Adelaide? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even so, even more so now, I think. Right. But when, what time was it? What period uh, in this uh, early part of your life that you decided that you you wanted to be a, an entertainer? Oh uh, well, when I was, when I came back the second time, I, we moved into another migrant hostel, which wasn't quite as bad, but this one had cardboard walls. So I could uh, I could hear the radio from up the, up the road, uh, and uh, this oh, is my came on, you know, the sound. It was always present with Heartbreak Hotel, and I just fell in love with it immediately. I was only 13, 14, mm. and that's what I wanted to be. And I started sticking pictures of him up on the walls and doing impersonations of him with with uh, plastic uh, cardboard guitars and borrowed Dad's jacket, jacket so mm. they draped properly. Yeah and got into it that way, just entertained friends. And what sort of, uh, of semi-pro bands did you get involved with to start with? Because, there were, I mean, at that time you're talking about, I mean, every kid was in a band, wasn't they? Yeah. And there were well, some extraordinary creations, I remember. In those days, yeah. it was all lead singer, you know, Snotty and the Nose Pickers. And <laughs> That's right. Clint Thigh and the Lusts. 
So uh, it was all very much a vocal group and uh, a singer and a band. They're all separate entities and they all put on package shows. Then the Beatles came along and uh, made the bass player and the drummer. They, they formed that cohesive group thing and uh, made everybody more important and the lead singer molded back into it. And that's what happened to us. I started life as a vocal group singing folk songs and uh, other uh, Danny and the Juniors sort of things. And then the Beatles came along, shifted everybody 300 y yards sideways, made it a business. And um, well, uh, we were just there at the right time. We just hung on to that bandwagon and went on, off on that whole Mersey thing that happened. Do you get to meet the Beatles at all? Close, not Close. quite. Yeah. Yeah. I bumped into Paul McCartney once at a club, <laughs> but uh, he didn't say excuse me either. Um, <laughs> No, we're, the, the nicest thing that happened to us was when, this is the Twilight's my first group and my fondest group, because it was a very family thing. And uh, we were there in, in Abbey Road, one lovely sprinkly snowy night. And uh, the bloke said, hey, you picked a good time to come here, mate. I said, why? Well, he said, look at this. And he opened the book and there's block bookings. It's the group, the group. It's booking the studio. And he said, this is the Beatles. We went, oh, you know, because we were all you know, George Harrison grew a moustache, we grow moustaches. No. And uh, it so happened that while we were recording our three tunes, they were in the next studio up the corridor recording Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, it was. And of course, I'd sneak up and put my ear to the door and hear order fish and finger pie and things like this and wonder what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, was... People still are, yeah. 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 So it was a very exciting time and George Martin popped into the studio and said, good show, lads. Show good, sounds good. He's terribly British, isn't he? Well, that's why I've never met him before yeah, or since, yeah. you know. Yeah, but they used to be, I used to do a show in Manchester, in fact, where they, they were the resident group. In just, Manchester? Yeah. yeah. As the Silver Beatles? No, 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 just as the Beatles. And then they went away and made their first hit record, mm. and the next time I saw them, they came back on the show as, as superstars. And they were big, yeah. And McCartney asked me for my autograph. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, I've really arrived. And as I stand there, he said, it's, it's for my mother. It's for my mother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they all say that, don't they? They all say yeah. that, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tell me, uh, you've made it now in, in a very big way. I mean, you are, as I said, next to, alongside the Bee Gees and uh, little Olivia. I mean, you're Australia's most lucrative and best known musical expo export. Yeah. I mean, is it, what, what are the problems? We're talking about the Beatles there. I mean, apart from Paul, the rest of them got fairly sort of uh, bashed about, didn't they, in the, in the success and the scrabble for it? Well, it was a very difficult time. I mean, no one, uh, things hadn't happened that way before. It was a whole, whole social revolution. It wasn't just music. And they were the symbols, they were the, the focal point of the whole thing. And I'm sure it was very hard for them. McCartney seems to be the professional musician. He mm. seems to be uh, the but one what, that keeps What I was getting at, I wondered how difficult it was. I mean, you do a lot of touring. I mean, you have the fame and all that sort of thing. How difficult is it, is it to keep your head together in a situation like that? Well, it's, it's a lot easier now. Uh, we're not uh, bothered by that sort of uh, hysteria or anything. You know, we're fairly family oriented people. And that shows in our music, I think. We don't attract uh, a lot of uh, controversy. Maybe we should attract a bit more. You know, we, we uh, tend to be regarded as a little bit bland at times, mm -hmm. which we kick up about. But we're just not very visible. You know, we like to keep a little bit lower profile. Mm. So we don't get caught up in it. Well, you know, we get drunk and things like that. Everybody does. You know, the road crew and everybody get together and it's all fun. But most of the time it's hard work and mm. you can't afford to. Uh, relax too much. But I think one of the attendant uh, problems of that kind of thing, though, is that you can get into drugs, you can get heavily into booze and whatever, can't you? You can do and whatever you like, but uh, that's up to the individual what mm -hmm. they do. What about you, Barry? Because, I mean, you went through a period, did you not, in your life, where, I mean, you were heavily into drink, weren't you? Yes, well, I, uh, you know, people go to parties and get drunk. I used to get drunk and go to parties. <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I decided that, uh, you know, there are a lot of funny things that happened after I uh, had stopped noticing. So, no, I don't drink. Um, I enjoy, you know, the other, the second part of the day a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I also find that I can do my job a lot better. I think a lot of people who, whose task it is, whose uh, good fortune, whose gift it is to be able to entertain others, feel somehow that along with that has to go a kind of an erratic form of living. And I don't think that is so. In fact, um, I think the more orderly one's life does become, I don't mean in a terribly boring way, but no. the more of a simple routine you have, 
and the better health, physical health you, you have. You can do your job better. The better job you do. And sure. then you get wonderful satisfaction mm. out of that. What was the lowest point of your particular phase, though, Barry? I mean, what was the, what was the, the, the turning point for you? Where you decided one day, God, I've got to stop it. I think it, I think it was uh, when I was in a very nice private hospital for my nerves. <laughs> Green walls? No, it was no, no, it was just like a sort of very nice room, and there was a television set and all sorts of things. And the nurse came in and poured me a large brandy. And I said, "What's that for?" She said, "Oh, that's part of the treatment." <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, if that's... Part, I suddenly looked at it and I thought, I really don't want it. Mm. I was at a point, I was looking out of the window at people going to work and driving cars and doing some watering the garden. You know, I had a sort of panorama of the Melbourne suburbs outside the window, it seems. And I thought, well, am I ever going to get, join that race of people? Or am I just going to be a very separate, rather isolated and miserable sod? I think once you start drinking alone, I think that's when you should start to worry. Well, particularly in a private nursing home. I... Yeah. <laughs> you see... I... <laughs> you see, I think what a lot of people do at some stage in their lives in order to reach other people, you know, they think, oh, it'll be fun to go on the Parkinson show, I'll meet Michael Parkinson. Um, but in order to be able to do that, I need to have this amount of champagne or that amount of whiskey, you know. And, of course, the Michael Parkinson show can then mm. be a total disaster for mm. all concerned. I'm on Vegemite myself. <laughs> well, that, I believe, is a derivative of La Foster's Lager. I believe it's <laughs> it? scraped out of the inside of the vat. It's the essence, isn't it? It's the essence, I guess. But, but uh, you so. know, I, I think, uh, yes. But, you've, I mean, you you so how long ago was it? Cold, cold turkey, was it? Nearly ten years, I think. And not a drop since? At all. No, I drink lots of mineral water, which I like. And a lot of tea. I love tea. I like everything. I enjoy all the very good things of life. And I'm very relieved to find that I have a simple allergy to one of the very good things of life, which happens to be booze. And uh, It doesn't suit me. And I'm glad I've found that out. I found it out in time. And um, life is very good. And I'm glad, uh, you know, this has happened. I found, in fact, uh, uh, that what you were saying is absolutely true. The worst experiences I've had on the show have been with people who have been drunk beforehand, who've had to, who've needed, needed that to, yeah. to get on. Is that a high incidence of that? Not, not too high, thank God. Mm. But um, when they get on, those lights hit them, and the adrenaline really goes, starts to go, yeah. and their brain goes. Yeah. And uh, does the same happen with Vegemite? <laughs> <laughs> Cold turkey. You know, you branched out into, into acting recently, haven't you? Well, more of a twig rather than a branch. It's, uh, <laughs> I did the Paul Hogan shows last year, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, I want to do that ever since I was a kid. Peter Sellers was my idol. Mm. And I'd like to be like him. I still would like to do that sort of character part. But uh, I'm also doing, um, well, I hope to be doing the Johnny O'Keefe story later on in the oh, year. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. I mean, do you identify with him? I mean, that's coming back to what well, we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, sense? obviously I would identify with, uh, with him. I never knew him professionally or personally. I only saw him about twice. But uh, I can identify with the, the struggle that he went through, the Aussie battler thing. Mm. Getting Australian rock and roll played on radio was a very difficult thing in those days, and he was a pioneer in that. But uh, the film is look, looking positive, and I, I'm pretty positive about it. It won't be a comedy, you know. It's, uh, be warts and all. Mm -hmm. And all this acting um, ambition, does that run alongside the, the band? Does that include the band? Oh, or are, or yeah. are you coming to a point where you're, you're thinking, well, you know, we've been there long enough, let's, let's get out off this particular... Well, um, it's, a lot e it's a lot easier now. Well, those frustrations can be satisfied because the band is successful and we don't have to work day in, day out to pay the rent. So we, we're given uh, half the year almost to ourselves to pursue whatever else we want. But LRB has to have priority because that's... Uh, my career. That's what I've been doing for the last five years and I want to see it through as long as it does go for, which could be, I don't know, could be in the grey areas. But I really would like to get into the visual side of things. I'd also like to uh, get into documentaries. I'd love to uh, you know, do a uh, David Attenborough sort of thing. Really? Yes, I'd love to do uh, What, script and, and, and...? Produce. I'd like to yeah. produce. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I can use some of the money that I seem to be getting these days in brown paper parcels in the back <laughs> stand. <laughs> yes. Can put, can put it into uh, maybe some documentary production and also maybe get involved in the uh, 
you know, the front line. You know. Can I ask you finally the two of you a, a question which interests me? You, the two of you have succeeded in an area where previously, uh, before you came along, the two of you, I mean, Australians had not been rather thick on the ground internationally. I mean, you were a bigger star, if, if that's possible, in, in Britain than you are here. I mean, you, the band in America, is, is a massive success. How yeah. difficult was it to convince people that you weren't Martians, <laughs> that, you know, that, that Australians weren't this kind of lost tribe? Well, it was very difficult. I mean, you know, you, you get the, uh, the Midwest sort of thing. Um, uh, Australia, that's uh, next to Switzerland, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. And do you speak English down there? So you just throw a can of Foster's at them and tell them to shut up. And, uh, it's getting better, isn't it? I think so. I think you have to explain in America that uh, if it wasn't for Australia and you show them where it is on the map, uh, you know, that in the Second World War they would there would now be a lot more Japanese restaurants in New York. <laughs> um, I used to have a false map. I, I had an enormous map of Australia which occupied half the globe. <laughs> I used to say, well, you see, there's the United States, and then I would sort of trace my finger, and there would be yeah. this enormous continent. Say, Look like Russia didn't know that was there. It's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think it's still true, though, don't you, Glenn, that um, Australians still have to achieve something elsewhere to be recognised in Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise people think, well, he's still in Australia, he couldn't be that good. Yeah, yeah well, we, we haven't moved overseas like Olivia and uh, the Bee Gees did, and it took them to go over there to make it, and they still live there. We still live here. You know, because you're we want to here. stay here, and this is where we started here. Right. And that's very, very important to us, to be emotionally Australian as well. Uh, other than being professionally Australian. Well, Glenn Charles, for the moment, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks thank you. Much. Now, even in the wacky world of entertainment where nothing's quite what it seems, my final guest has had a career which can only be described as extraordinary. In the late 30s and 40s, she was a starlet in West End musicals and reviews. At the same time, she became a star of British film in the days when Britain had a film industry. She moved to Kenya and produced and directed television shows in English, Sikh and Swahili. Now, as far as Australia is concerned, she didn't exist until 64, when she helped devise and starred in the Mavis Brampton show. The establishment winced, the public loved it, and she was off and running. She's not stopped since on either television or stage. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Carol Ray. Don't take too long over the greetings. Oh. How do we do? Perhaps I should say to start with, I haven't had any Vegemite. Haven't you? No, and I haven't had a drink. No, well, <laughs> so you, you couldn't right. have a drink and look as beautiful as oh. you do. Oh, oh. Nice smooth talking. Isn't he lovely? Yeah. Isn't he lovely? <laughs> How come you were producing television shows in Kenya, of all places? Well, the, the, the reason I was in uh, Kenya, Michael, was because my husband was there. And uh, I remember when I first got married, my darling mother-in-law saying, you really must make up your mind if you get married that you're prepared to follow your husband round the world barefoot. Well, I haven't had to do it barefoot, but almost 30 years later, I'm still following him round the world, you see. So we were in Kenya because my husband uh, is a vet and went out there in the colonial service. and. Um, when we first went there, the Mau Mau uh, emergency was on and we lived up country on a farm where my husband was uh, working. But in the latter part of our time there, I suppose the last two years, television started in Nairobi. And uh, I had the good fortune to uh, go back to England and take the BBC television producers course and was one of the first three uh, producer directors in the new uh, television station in Kenya, well, but that's not as grand as it sounds. No, I'm sure it's not. It was a minute, tiny little station, and we had no video or anything, and uh, everything went out live in three languages, you see. Were you fluent in three languages? <laughs> I don't know who told you that. I can speak Swahili, Jambo Buana, Habari Yaakov. That means, uh, good evening, master. How are you? I like the uh, master bit, <laughs> particularly, don't you? You should insist on that from now on. Yeah. Um, that, that's about all. Um, well, what about the British movies that you starred in? Because, I mean, there was a period, was there not, in the sort of 40s, where, I mean, you 
You did quite a few. But what kind of what kind of movies were they? Oh God! Uh, well, I mean, I went through a period of enormous embarrassment when some of these movies that I had done years and years ago started appearing on television endlessly. There was one called Waltz Time, where I was a, a Viennese uh, empress and sang nothing more, you know, a lot. And uh, <laughs> Richard Tauber sang in a field with some sheep. It was all lovely. <laughs> it was one of those, you know. It's got lots of comic and, possibilities. <laughs> hmm? uh, although, strangely at the time as well, a cheap budget film, you see, that went over to America and was really a big success there. Played on Broadway in one of those, what, what they called uh, a continental film house. We were a continental film. Uh, for ages, but it was really dreadful in retrospect. And having been a musical, artist. I was amazed when after that one musical they kept putting me in these dramas. I kept coming out of the mist in Cornwall in a thing called uh, The Dream of Alwyn and playing the piano. It was really Eileen Joyce but it was me. You know, I came back and Sonia Dresdell was my long lost sister. And another one I was a cripple. <laughs> Robert Beatty made me well and we went we went on our honeymoon in this film to Whitby in Yorkshire. Well, you can imagine well, that on location, you know, <laughs> waiting for the sun to come out and feeling you should have been there with your Russian salad. It was lovely. <laughs> Terrible films, and recently some of them have been out here about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's cringe time, isn't it? Cringe yeah. time. Yes. Did you ever get the, the the Hollywood offer? Well, yes, I did actually once. Uh, I was offered an MGM uh, seven-year contract, uh, which, uh, in retrospect, I mean, if somebody offered me that now, I you know I would say, oh, ah, ah, and fall in a heap. But then you see, I was in love. And I was just about to get married and thought, oh, boring, uh, boring. And so I married my penniless bet. And uh, here I am. And you went to America, in <laughs> fact, with him, didn't, did you not? And yes, gave I got up your married career for a while. What in What kind of jobs did you do in that time when you were in the States and not, not acting? Well, we were penniless because uh, Robert went over on a, a Fulbright scholarship, which was only just for one f person living in the university. And I, as soon as I finished the show I was doing in London, I went over as fast as I could. But then you, that was 1951, you couldn't uh, take money out of England and there were restrictions. So we were both trying to live on this uh, penniless vet's grant uh, down in Louisiana, Baton Rouge. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever been there. Have oh, you yes. been there? Love then? Baton you know, well, there's not a lot of jobs going no, on not for, really, for actresses no. who can't really no, do I, much I else. I met a sheriff's daughter down there once. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's sugarcane country. Anyway, the first thing I thought I'd do is, uh, well, perhaps I could teach elocution. And uh, I always remember trying all these sweet people who lived there, knew we didn't have much money, and sent, I'm sure, forced their children to come along and be given forcibly these elocution lessons for me to, to earn some money. And I remember teaching them, or trying, the owl and the pussycat. And they would say in their little southern voices, the owl and the pussycat went <laughs> to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. And I'd say, no, boat, a boat. <laughs> that didn't last long. Then I got a job in a shop and we managed. What about the rest of you? Because you've all had the odd jobs. So what's the worst job you had, Barry? <laughs> the daftest job you the had? The worst was in an ice cream factory. Was it? <laughs> I was in the raspberry ripple department. <laughs> Walls Acton, it was. Walls Acton, was it? Yes, it was for the night shift, too. <laughs> Mind you, the, the Raspberry Ripple department knew neither day nor night. It was <laughs> eternal. And I was there with a lot of black people. And uh, they the were given Raspberry. the worst jobs. The, the Australian and the black people. <laughs> and my job was when the packets of Raspberry Ripple got injured on the machine, and you know, there's a fair bit of it. Sometimes the packets get damaged, yeah. the claw comes out and squashes. <laughs> they get thrown into bins, and these bins are taken to a remote part of the Raspberry River <laughs> wing, and a group of well, what are called in Australia no hopers would sit around and peel the cardboard off the Raspberry Ripple and flick the ice cream into a drum in the middle of the room. This from 7 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock next morning. <laughs> It must have extended the mind somewhat. It did. I, in, I was auditioning for shows in the daytime, but smelling so strongly of ice cream. It was <laughs> terrible. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> what about you, Glenn? Have you had any daft jobs like that? 
Not as daft as that. No, I uh, I was an apprentice fitter and turner for a while, following father's footsteps. Mm. But uh, I couldn't con on to that. That was like 110 degrees in a tin shed factory. The first thing they did was give you a hunk of two inch hardened steel and said file that to an inch diameter with a two thou tolerance. You know, so you're doing that all day long. <laughs> I, I couldn't see a future in that at all. But since then, I've, I've been very lucky and haven't had to fall back on anything. Hmm. Sounds more skilled than my job. <laughs> <laughs> but not as, not as tasty. <laughs> I, I fact mentioned in the introduction uh, to you, Carol, this thing about the Mavis Bramston show here, which that was a kind of satire time, wasn't it, both here and, and in Britain. Oh, yes. What kind of reaction did it provoke here? Well, I think tremendous. I think any Australians uh, here would most probably agree that it really did have one of the biggest impacts uh, in television that there had been for many, many years. And I think mainly because um, we hadn't had any satire uh, on television here. You hadn't had any comedy. Well, no, not that sort of comedy. I mean, I, I, I went into the Bramston uh, era literally about uh, oh, two months after I arrived here, so I hadn't seen all that much before. But certainly there hadn't been anything of that satirical nature. Neither had there been in England until shortly before that was that was the week yes, that right. was uh -huh. was really what started yeah. it all. Mm. But what and kind of uh, what kind of a uh, of, of sort of um, organised protest was there about it? Oh, enormous amount. I remember particularly. Oh gosh, there were endless things. But when we started, there was outrage. There were questions asked in Parliament. I remember one occasion when I can't remember the luckily the particular MPs in question who were asking questions. But there was a rather pompous panel on ABC shortly after this, where the interviewer was asking these various people, an MP and some lady who was rather straight laced and so on, all about uh, their opinions on the program and why they protested. And the next night, uh, the next Bramston, we repeated this panel on the show and sent it sky high. And I think really we weren't out to shock, but we were rather irreverent and hoped, I think through humour, to make people think about But what kind of things were they things. objecting to? I mean, well, what sort of sketch would there be? particular sketch. Do you remember the flower arrangement sketch? Does anybody here remember the flower arrangement sketch? This was, we were trying to say something about censorship, and this particular sketch at the time was just between uh, supposedly Gordon Chater, who was uh, with Barry Creighton and myself, we were the three people in the show. Gordon was meant to be a, a plainclothes um, man of the vice squad, and I was his you know, suburban wife reading a magazine. And the form the sketch took was really just he was saying, what are you reading? I was saying, just a magazine. And he's saying, let me look at it. Filth, filth, filth. Uh, listen to this. You put this stalk in the vase, and then as the water gets warm, it droops a little. And my god, filth, filth. And I mean, we were trying to say, you can see filth in anything. Right. if you. But this sketch so offended. It was real constant spry, we read, that we were banned. And I remember the Catholic. Uh, community were told they weren't to buy ample shares. They were sponsoring the show at the time. <laughs> and uh, people's children weren't allowed. I don't know if you remember oh, that, Glenn. Oh, no, there I was a fuss, show. wasn't there, though? I remember, I remember the show being extremely funny, and I still do think it was a forerunner. Yes. But what these people don't understand, shock, the, the, the protesters, mean... is it's counterproductive, the protest. I mean, it, it achieves exactly the opposite of what they want it to well, achieve, does it not? The, I mean, the ratings went up and up and up. I remember we had ratings of 65 in Perth. <laughs> and I mean, it was just amazing, yes, the impact. Yes. And uh, I suppose because it was a first, in a way. Yes. What about you, Barry? Have you had any problems at all from these people, from pressure groups, from... Festivals yes, of I Light remember the so. comic strip Barry McKenzie, which was run in Private Eye uh, until it came out uh, ten years ago in omnibus books, was banned in this country. You know, uh, as recently as 1968, there was a ban on Private Eye, mainly in Australia, mainly because it contained a comic strip about an Australian. And people didn't like to see an Australian speaking his own vernacular. Mm. Particularly, it was a rather vulgar Australian vernacular. Mm. Very amusing. <laughs> you know, we do have one of the very living languages, don't we? <laughs> very colourful, yes. <laughs> it <laughs> does grow like the Barrier Reef. <laughs> <laughs> and with lots of interesting polyps. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, uh, the comic strip too. I mean, even the, when the comic strip became a movie, there was terrible worry about the Barry McKenzie film. It wouldn't matter so much if it was shown in Australia. People said, you're not going to show that overseas. 
because it's overseas that worries us. So. <laughs> what will people think? You know, there won't be too many any slang in the film. <laughs> An official from the Australian Film Corporation rushed out to the airport before we went to London to make it. He said, I trust there won't be any colloquialisms in the film. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few swear words. Did you get sent off by Celeste Patterson? I mean, did he? <laughs> well, Celeste Patterson is a marvellous opportunity for me to impersonate the, the absurd extremes of this kind of officialdom, of course. But Celeste is another Edna because he's grotesque, permanently drunk. <laughs> like that person we were talking Incredible about drag. before. <laughs> but all this. You know, can't wait to get into a private nursing home and be given a case of brand new <laughs> can, I, can I ask you, Carol, because uh, you, you uh, had several careers, you know, in England and, and here. You once left here, in fact, went back to England, did you not? And came back again. Um, was this a, co a question of, of looking for acceptance? Or, I mean, I put it another way, was there a time, a moment in Australia, when you felt accepted as, a, as an Aussie? Well, I've always been very welcomed here, um, at least I felt I have, and I felt enormously privileged because I fell in love with Australia the moment the Oriana, which we came here and tied up under that harbour bridge 16 years ago. I, I mean, I just felt particularly Sydney was my city, and that maybe sounds a bit soppy, but I believe it. And every time I've been away, increasingly over the years, particularly this last year I was in England, every time I felt, hmm, England's all right, and I like to see my friends and all that, but be nice, you know, Sydney's better. But this time, I really couldn't wait to get on that plane and come home. So I've always felt at home, but I suppose really perhaps the moment of truth for me, uh, of acceptance, was this last year when um, I was asked to do uh, the new David Williamson play, Travelling North, because uh, he is our leading playwright and wonderful too, um, the Nimrod Theatre is something very unique and special, which is truly Australian and has done marvellous things, and I think now is being accepted in England. Um, wonderful director, John Bell, and to play the part of a 55-year-old Melbourne middle-aged mum. And I thought, apart from wanting to do it professionally, they must think I'm Australian enough to do this. And I really was very chuffed about that. And it was, you know, a wonderful experience, and I loved it. Carol, thank you very much indeed. Carol Ray. Thank you. <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Glenn, sir, to go over there mm -hmm. and join the band, the River Band, to, to play yes. us out. Will you do that? Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, my thanks then to, uh, away you go, Glenn. This way? Yeah, of course, sir, mate. My thanks to Barry Humphreys, to Glenn Shirok, and to Carol Ray. Uh, we close the show tonight with the biggest hit the Little River, River Band ever had in America. It's called Reminiscing. While they close out from all of us here, a very good night. Good night. Good night.